Right then, I've replaced the battery of the radio mic again, so I can put it around, yeah. Uh, today's lecture is about poverty and social exclusion. As I've been touching on throughout the module, a lot of the core of what social policy is about is about poverty. It's social policy is almost, it's sort of the academic discipline of studying misery and how we tackle misery. And I could make the entire module about poverty, but I don't, I just sort of encapsulate it down into this, into this one lecture. So in today's lecture, what I want to talk about is, first of all, how do policy makers define poverty? And why do we need to define poverty at all? Why can't we just say we're poverty exists, let's tackle it? Why do we need to have some, some definition of poverty that we can work with? And I'll mainly focus on the income measure that the UK government uses uh, to define poverty, but then briefly to touch on that uh, and compare the income measure to material measures. You'll do a lot more of that in the workshop later in semester, in workshop seven, when you look at the necessities list from the poverty and social exclusion survey. Sorry I started a bit early, if you've not missed anything, it's a boring content slide. <laughs> then I'll go on to talk a bit more about well, yes, we can have these official definitions of poverty, but then how has government defined poverty more generally, and how has it brought in causal effects into its definition of poverty, and focus on the way that child poverty and pension poverty have been particular focuses of government, and therefore have been uh, a policy success in many regards. You'll see that in the statistics I'll show you. And finally, I will touch on what I talked about in the blog post on Tuesday about the family, uh, the Trouble Families Project down in England. There's a um, lot of news stories earlier this week about that and about this idea of early intervention and problem families being associated with, with poverty. So, J.K. Rowling, in a really wonderful quote, describes poverty as um, poverty means a thousand petty humiliations and hardships. And I think for me, this really evokes the reality of poverty. That we can talk about poverty in an abstract way, but the lived experience of poverty, and I had an incredibly powerful email from a student last year about this, is about shame and stigma. It's about not having enough money to eat. It's about not having enough money to wear the clothes your friends wear. And feeling that deep, intense shame and stigma of that. And if you've listened to the podcast interview with my mother, I think that comes through in her stories of growing up in the 1950s. And she could joke about them now. She could joke about having to have sports shorts that were so big she never grew into them. Now, now she's sitting early 70. She also, she didn't talk about it in the podcast, she's talked to me in the past about the fact that her parents smoked and they were so poor they couldn't afford cigarettes. And they lived in London and so she used to have to pick up, in them days you could um, smoke on underground train platforms but not in the trains themselves. And so people would stub out their cigarettes when the train arrived. And she was made by her mother to pick up the long cigarette stubs so that her parents could pick out the tobacco from them and roll their own. And this shame of that, of possibly being seen by your friends doing that. I think it's that, that, this quote from J.K. Rowling really sums that up, the, that stigma, these petty humiliations that living and experiencing poverty results in. So why, but then why do we need to define poverty in a more objective way? Well, we don't know we have a problem unless we can measure its seriousness and extent. So we can't actually tackle a problem unless we can measure it in some way. But also then, okay, we recognise we've got a problem, but then well, what can we do about it? We can only work out what we might do about it if we know what it is and what causes it. And finally, going back to that first thing of the uh, finding out we've got a problem, we can only find out if we've actually made a difference to this problem 
whether we actually solve the problem if we can measure it, if we can actually measure change in, our, in populations. So therefore, this, this question of deciding who is poor, who is experiencing poverty, is key in policy making. The main sort of th uh, thinker who has, or sort of academic, who his work was sort of incredibly important in the way we think about poverty globally, but particularly in the UK, was Peter Townsend. And his big insight was thinking about poverty in relative terms. So his definition of poverty from his book, big book, Poverty in the UK from 1979, don't read it, it's about gay big, is that poverty is the absence of inadequacy of both diet, amenities, standards, services, and activities which are common or customary in a society. So that's saying that a society, say the UK today in 2016, has these certain things that are customary that we expect to have. So for example, a classic one would be now would be a mobile phone. Now I think most people would agree if you didn't have a mobile phone, you were in poverty because you weren't part of the customs of contemporary British society. If you'd asked that 20 years ago, you'd have got very different answers. So these relative measures of poverty change over time. That was his key insight, was we can think about poverty in a relative way. We can think about who is poor in any given context or society. <coughs> now, the other concept, the other idea behind, of pop, or the concept of poverty is absolute poverty. And the UK government do actually have an income measure of absolute poverty. And that absolute poverty measure is households that will earn less than half the median income. And I'll come to that back to this point about median. I mentioned it um, earlier in my announcement yesterday. Um, I'll come back, back to it later. So, but it be, be clear, it's the median income. And that idea behind that, that absolute poverty measure is, if you're in absolute poverty, then you really, you'll be in hunger, um, you'd be high risk of homelessness, you'd be living an absolute grim existence in that absolute poverty measure. And that gives you an idea, so the, the UK government then use income measures to understand poverty. They focus on household income as a measure of poverty. Now the, the relative poverty measure, so going back to Townsend's definition of poverty, the relative poverty measure the UK government uses is households that will earn less than two thirds of the equivalised median income. So less than two thirds of the equivalised median income. Now what I want you to do just for a minute is turn to the person next to you and have a discussion about what do you think equivalised mean? What do you think that word equivalised means? Just have a quick word with the person next to you and see if you can come up with an answer. more time? Right, has anybody, anybody come up with an answer they're willing to share? Put your hands up if you're willing to. You don't have to speak to the microphone, I can just relay it back through my mind. Anybody? Can I put their hand up and come up with one? Anybody? Two? Okay. I just want to ask this what they mean by the absolute 
So, and it's a relationship with the um, absolute poverty measure. Yeah, it's like we've got absolute relative effect that the aim should be the same, the equivalent of each other. You're right, but a, a good guess. <laughs> Anybody else want to have a go? Right, okay. It's very, very, very simple. So, does a household with a single man need the same income as a household with a single mother and two children? Hands up for yes. Anybody? No. Hands up for no. You've got the right answer. So that's, based, that's what equivalise means. It means the measure is adjusted for the household circumstances. And those household circumstances include the size of the household, the number of children, the age of the children, and disability within the household. So people with disa disabilities or disabled people are recognised as needing a higher income than non-disabled people. So very, very big word, sounds complicated, means something very, very simple. What it also means, though, is you, the UK poverty measure is not a fixed amount. You can't say it is X tens of thousand pounds a year because it varies depending on which household you consider because it's equivalised to the different households. Just to make things a little bit more complicated as well, they also break it down into Poverty before housing costs and after housing costs. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to why that might be the case? Oh. I get to do my running around the street. Yeah, so it's fixed costs in a household, no matter what the size of the house is. And also, it, does housing cost the same? Does housing cost the same wherever it is? No, as well. So yeah, you've got two things. You've got the fact that housing itself, um, you, there's a, sort of a set standard you need. So although a, a lone person might have a smaller household than a larger house, a smaller house than a larger Household is a set amount of housing people need, but also you have this issue that housing does not cost the same throughout a country. In, in the UK, it's particularly about housing in London is so much more expensive than housing elsewhere. The poverty rates after housing costs in London are ridiculously high because people are paying so much of their income in rent. So it adjusts for that change as well. Yay for engagement, thank you. Right, what does this, <coughs> so this is just a graph as well to give you an indication of what equivalisation means in practice. So the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, they, come up, they came, up, came up with their own measure of poverty. It's more of a material measure of poverty. And what they do is every year they run a number of focus groups where they ask people, well, what, what do you think you need to be that household that Peter Townsend talks about that is included in the customs of society? What do you think you need? They include things like an annual holiday abroad, computers, uh, mobile phones, etc., etc. And then they work out, well, how much do you need to earn to get those material things? And then from that, they, cre they create their own a minimum income standard is called rather than a poverty level. And you'll see there that the, um, these are, this is what they've um, suggested how this um, will change over time. But what I want you to focus on is you've got the different types of household at the bottom and the lines are changing depending on what the different types of household is. So it's an example of that equivalization in practice. Now, so you've worked out the poverty rate. Let's actually look at some statistics now. So, this is from the UK government's own data. Households with low average income, it's called. 
At the moment, the EU says all member states have to collect this data so you can get it for all EU member states, and it's, all the measures are the same throughout. And if you just um, Google housing below average income on, and then put gov.uk, you'll find the website and you can download this data yourself. They've made it available as an Excel spreadsheet you can download and play with yourself. So I made these graphs myself last week. Took me out 10 minutes. So <clears throat> what's been happening? So this is the graph for working age adults. And what you'll see there is from 1994 or 95, when this um, was first uh, measured, we've seen a very dramatic fall in absolute poverty, from 33% to 20%. So clearly, poverty, uh, policy around absolute poverty is working really well. It's making big inroads. It's reduced that rate by 13 percentage points. What about relative poverty? Here, then, we see a much more mixed picture. So the rate back in the early 1990s was 20%. And then from 2000, when you had that big, long period of economic growth from 1992 right through to 2008, you've got very high levels of employment, very high wages, so lots of people in work, but also concerted effort from government in tackling poverty. You see those few years in the middle where this relative poverty rate hit a steady 19%. And then from 2005, 6 onwards, it started to creep up. And then in 2008, 9, with the economic crash, we see a big leap from 21% and then a peak of 22% in 2009, 10. Since then, it's dropped back down slightly, but it's stubbornly now stuck at 21% of the working age adult population are in relative poverty by the income measure. But children, here the effort, policy effort is even more dramatic when we look at absolute poverty. Back in 1994-95 you had an absolutely shocking, appalling half, over half of children living in absolute poverty. Absol it just makes you ashamed to live in the country that that was the state that we were in back then. And then 2014-15, that's plummeted to, by over 20 percentage points to 27%. So made massive inroads in tackling absolute poverty among households with children. Really, really concerted effort there. What about relative poverty then? That's after housing poverty. Relative low income. Not quite such a good picture then. Actually, that data must be right. Hang on, I'll go back to that graph and look at that graph again. There's something up with that. Those figures, that's not a percentage, that percentage isn't right, hang on, but anyway, right, Re relative poverty, which is the most interesting one, not quite so much progress there, so we've got 33% in 1994 95 of household with children experiencing poverty, some concerted effort in the middle noughties going, dropping down to 28%, a little bit of a bulge up, and then dropping to 27% in 2010, and then a slow tick up there. So that seems to be a bit more stubborn. We're not seeing quite such policy inroads in the relative poverty measure there. Again, we see from the most recent data, the 2015-16 data, one of the real successes of policy, but also just because you've heard the baby boomer generation and this idea of intergenerational inequity, the fact that people who were born in the 1940s and 50s are now very wealthy, this comes through in this data, um, but basically pension of poverty has reduced dramatically. So pension of poverty in 1995, relative after housing cost poverty, was at 28%. That's now halved to only 14% of pensioners experience relative poverty. So in, in disabled people, we've seen a really dramatic reduction in absolute poverty. Actually, I think I need to go, I will go back to the data. I think the 51% is percentage of people in low income households who are in absolute poverty. So it's 51% of 30%, so it's 15% of the overall population, I think. I need to go back and check the data. 
Um, so we've seen a real reduction in absolute poverty among disabled people, and again, that relative poverty measure seems to be stickier. That's the one that the government's struggling to tackle. Now, what I want to do now is show you that you are more intelligent than um, a government, ex-government minister and a very, very important MP. So, we have this measure reiterate for you. The households that earn less than two-thirds of the median income. That's our poverty measure. Now, Ian Duncan Smith said, you get this constant juddering adjustment with poverty figures going up when, for instance, upper incomes rise or Frank Field, any candidate sitting GCSE maths should be able to explain that rising everybody above a set percentage of the median income is rather like asking a cat to chase its own tail. As families are raised above the target level of income, the median point itself rises. Not surprisingly, therefore, no country in the free world has managed to achieve this objective. I asked you to go back and look in your secondary school maths and find out the definition of the median and mean why is Frank Field wrong? Anybody want to hazard a guess as to why Frank Field is wrong? <coughs> Anybody? Really is absolute bog standard school math. I think I learned this when I was about 12. Right. Why Frank Field is wrong, my favourite slide. <laughs> he's wrong on many things, but he's very, very factually wrong on this. Right. So, the median, if you go back to your bath books, is the middle of any range of numbers. So, let's make this range of numbers and say that the number here is 1, the middle number is 2, and the far number is 3. So, the middle number in that series is 2. You've got three numbers, the middle one, 2. So, the median is that household just there. What happens if I change that 1 to a 2? Which is the middle number? So, this order then is 2, 2, 3. What's the middle number? 2, yes. So, I've lifted the bottom number up to the median, but the median, middle number is still the same. That's why Frank Field is wrong. What you can, so let's say so our measure is two thirds of median income, it's up there. We can lift everybody up to that level, and that median doesn't move. It's still the median income. Frank Field doesn't understand basic arithmetic. Got that clear? You can see what's happening there. Technically, my former colleague at Hale Rock University, Glenn Bramley, did some econometric analysis of this. He found out it would actually be technically impossible to lift everybody up to this level, but that's for very, very complicated reasons that are nothing to do with the basic maths that Frank Field has got completely wrong. So that's why we use the median as the measure, because you can lift people up to that without it moving. So, moving on then, so we've got this income definition of poverty. How else then has the government considered poverty? How else does it define poverty? Well, if we go back to 1979 to 1997, if you notice that household below average income data all started in the middle 1990s. In this period, which is the period of the Conservative government in the 80s, Arguably, or well, not arguably, but technically, or is more appropriate, technically no such thing as poverty. The government did not bother collecting any data that could be used to measure poverty. So go back to my initial questions, the government couldn't say there was a problem because it wasn't actually collecting the data to say there was a problem. So poverty did exist, it was out there in the country, but government was ignorant of it because it wasn't collecting the data. We move up to 1997, then how poverty changed then with the election of the new Labour government in 1997 was it became associated with social exclusion, and this term social exclusion. And this goes back to partly Peter Townsend definition, and this idea that if you were, your income was below a certain level, if you couldn't access these customary 
uh, items or um, uh, in your society, then you will be socially excluded from this society. This became a new way of thinking about poverty in policy from 1997 onwards. Tony Blair, in a quote that I can't find where he originally said it, but it turns up everywhere, says social exclusion is a shorthand label for what can happen when individuals or areas suffer from a combination of linked problems such as unemployment, poor skills, low incomes, poor housing, high crime environments, bad health and family break breakdown. What you'll see there is already that definition of poverty is becoming slipperier. It's starting to include more than just household income, more than just the household material circumstances. It's including things that the household has no, no control over, like the fact it's in a high crime environment. It's including things that actually might be caused by poverty, like family breakdown. Family breakdown, or the leading cause of family breakdown is financial stress. So already then, we, we're getting some messiness here. The government is confusing outcome measures with causes of poverty. In her really incisive analysis of this change in policy, in this discourse of um, social exclusion, Ruth Levitas identifies three different discourses, and she calls them mud, sin, and red. I'll talk about them in reverse order. Red, she refers to, is a redistribu redistributionist discourse. And that's a discourse, that's a policy language that says people are socially excluded because their incomes aren't high enough, because they experience poverty. So therefore, if we want to tackle social exclusion, we need to ensure people have higher incomes. We need to ensure people are in work, are in good quality work. And that's sort of a good, good lefty message, that one. Sid, so the social inclusionist discourse, she identifies as emerging in Britain in the mid-1990s. And it came actually from French social policy in the 1980s. And in France, the uh, motto of the French Revolution was liberty, egalité, fraternité. And uh, fraternité, this feeling of brotherhood, you're laughing at my French pronunciation, I see. Um, <laughs> Fraternity, this um, idea of brotherhood, was a key underpinning of the French state and French nationhood. And there was a fear in France in the 1980s that recent new migrants to France were not part of this brotherhood of the Republic, that they were excluded from the, um, that broader sense of uh, the, the Republic. So then the French policy began to focus on social inclusion, including these people in French society. And that spilt over into the UK in the 1990s, with a, and a particular focus of that was getting people into work. That if you're in the workplace, then you would be included in society. But you see there is a subtle shift in where the cause lies. In the redistributionist discourse, the causes of poverty and social exclusion are structural. They're in society. It's not your fault, your income is not high enough. It's society's fault. Move towards the social inclusion discourse. Well, it's sort of your fault because you're not in work. Get in work and you'll be included. But we will help you get in work, so don't worry about it. Mud is a moral underclass discourse. And Levitas identifies this as emerging in the 1980s. And I gave you some quotes at the start of the semester from Charles Murray. And he brought up this idea of the underclass from America into the UK. And this is a very moralizing discourse. This is saying you are socially excluded because you are morally corrupt. Because you can't keep your legs together and you keep popping out babies. That's why you're in poverty. It is that bored, is this moral underclass message. So in this social exclusion discourse that the Labour government was using, all of these different discourses were blended together, this mud, sid, and red. But what it particularly led to, though, was a focus on pensioner poverty and child poverty. The social exclusion po policies were targeted at these two groups, basically because they were groups that's easy to get sympathy for. 
When you see an NSPCC advert with some poor little teary-eyed child, you know, oh, we must tackle poverty, then it pulls your emotional heartstrings and it's a policy you'll vote for. So by target, and the same with uh, your, your old granny who's sort of living in a cold house, all these ideas, uh, this language of poverty, it's very easy to appeal to uh, people to get them to vote for these policies that target these particularly vulnerable groups. I want to focus now for the rest of the lecture on that last bit on child poverty. Because that's been changing recently. Because the, so in 20, I think 2009, 2009, 2010, the UK government passed the Child Poverty Act. The Child Poverty Act put in a statutory deadline for when the UK would eradicate child poverty. And by eradicating child poverty in the Act, it was based on that income measure I banged on about for the first 20 minutes of the lecture. The coalition government who came in in 2010 weren't happy about this. They didn't think that was appropriate for those mathematically illiterate reasons I gave earlier. So they wanted to bring in new indicators to understand child poverty. And these indicators were things like family structure, so was it a lone parent household or did they have two parents? Were people in the household disabled? Um, did the kids go to school? What was their truancy record? And this, these new measures were very much associated with sort of the language of resilience and early intervention. That if we could just make households more resilient to the shocks of, say, a partner leaving and becoming a lone parent household, then that household wouldn't experience poverty. If we could just get in households early and intervene early, then they wouldn't suffer poverty later on. Now, there are a number of problems with this, and I want to go through them in terms of some um, lengthy quotes. And these were identified at the time. Firstly, was that these were impossible to measure, and secondly, the issue of, well, are you actually measuring the right problem? So going back to those questions that I started the lecture with, are you actually measuring poverty and the right problem? <clears throat> so this is the UK government in its consultation on changing the measures of poverty. It gives you some idea of what they were saying, what, what their agenda was. So these measures rely heavily on income, but do not capture the full experience of growing up in poverty. Money itself does not ensure that a child achieves at school, that they learn the right to values, they develop good relationships, and it's only by helping families thrive through the early years, education and work, that we can break the cycle of disadvantage. Sorry for those on listening again, I just burped <laughs> So you can see these, these just change in measures coming in there in what the government was saying. Now the Poverty and Social Exclusion Survey, they responded to this consultation in a very, very critical way. So one of the measures was family stability. And this is the point of, um, well, can you actually measure it? Well, the meaning of family stability is not entirely clear what is meant by this ter term either. It would seem intuitively flawed to assume that any status by not changing should be considered good. Perhaps what is being suggested here is family structure, but that would be an incorrect avenue to pursue. There is a higher risk of child poverty in lone parenting cohabiting families, but this is a function of social po policy in the UK. It is not inevitable, and some countries avoid this association. So here they are confusing, they are arguing, the governments are confusing cause with effect. So the UK government is saying that single parent families should be a measure of poverty and the Poverty and Social Exclusion Survey researchers are saying no, low parenthood is a cause of poverty because you don't help low parents into work, you don't provide sufficient childcare, you don't provide sufficient income and if you did these things then these households wouldn't experience poverty poverty. We've got the evidence to show this. <coughs> the Poverty and Social Exclusion Survey as well did a, sort of, a, a further critique of 
The, the associated with this change in child poverty measure, the UK government and their um, anti-poverty czar, or anti troubled family czar, Louise Casey, produced this report, and they further um, um, criticised this. So here, potential dimensions are often illustrated with quotes highlighting the perceived behavioural shortcomings of people living in poverty. You want to get your parents down the job centre. And they appeared, overwhelming, they, they appeared to overwhelmingly confuse a measure of poverty with potential causes or conditions. This, it seems, is like trying to count the number of cases of flu in terms of counting all those with headaches, muscle pains, runny, runny noses, etc., instead of those without the flu virus in them. So the government here is confusing the outcomes of poverty and what the poverty leads to with well, what actually causes poverty and getting these two ends of that causal logic mixed up in their measures. However, so yeah, 2010, so the new, uh, the UK government has ploughed ahead. It's, um, it has actually, if you look at it, it has listened to some of the criticism of the consultation, and it is going to change, uh, it's going to introduce new legislation to change the definition of child poverty. So it includes the proportion of children living in workless households as well as long-term workless households, and also the educational attainment of all pupils and the most disadvantaged pupils at the age of 16. Again, though, that second bullet point, it is confusing the outcomes of poverty with the causes of poverty. Those of you in the room who are doing education, you should know by now that there is a very, very strong socioeconomic gradient between educational achievement and your income, your household income. So again, they're, they're saying that something that's caused by poverty, which is low educational attainment, is a measure of poverty. They've confused the cause and effect there. They're still continuing with this. Now, the other aspect of this is the Trouble Families Project. And I brought about that earlier this week because of the consultation, the evaluation that came out this week. Now, this Trouble Families Project has quite an interesting history. It goes back to uh, back in the 1990s, Dundee Council set up the Dundee Family Intervention Project. If you're a social work student, you might have come across this in your studies already. And it was there's an evaluation done by the Scottish Executive in 2001 about this. They said actually, yes, for these specific households that Dundee Council are sending to the Family Interventions Project, it's working quite well. It seems to actually be um, tackling issues of antisocial behaviour, getting parents into work, and getting, getting them, the households into long-term stable tenancies. But what that became after the riots in the UK in 2011, what that became was the idea that there were 120 or 150,000 families who measured on five or more indicators were particularly troubled, that they had to be the target of social policy. And this model in the Family Intervention Project was rolled out more broadly in the Troubled Families Project, but in a really cheap, crap way, not in the way that the um, Family Intervention Project did it, um, to deliver early intervention to turn around these households. And, uh, as I mentioned, it's linked to this very controversial research by Louise Casey. And there's a very, very good um, blog post if you follow the link there. But there's a lot of problems with this Trouble Families Programme. You, well, you know now it didn't work. We know we've got the evaluation evidence that it didn't work. But there's even more problems with it. And this is why it makes me really, really angry. So first of all, they're saying that there's 150 families that are troubled. So this is 0.86% of the UK population. Now, I showed you the graph earlier that shows that this is completely wrong if we talk about poverty. Poverty rates are nowhere near as low as this. If they were as low as this, it'd be fucking fantastic, but they're not. Poverty rates in the UK are hitting 20%, and that's a scandal. Absolute bloody scandal. Also, methodologically, 
The, that figure came from the Family Resources Survey, which is a longitudinal survey, so it follows the same households over time. It's not a cross-sectional sur survey. So it's, you can't say it's representative of the UK at any given time. It was representative of the UK when the study started, and it's followed the same families over time. So it's methodologically flawed, and the data is out of date as well, when David Cameron made it. But to focus in again, then, on the reality of poverty. So if we look at the Poverty and Social Exclusion Survey that was the world leading research on poverty and exclusion, using a material measure of poverty. It found that a third of households in the UK are in material poverty. So they can't, don't have enough money or they don't own the material things that the rest of us take for granted. And these aren't swanky things. These are things like a coat, a warm coat. The household can't afford a warm coat. And 15%, the same survey found that 15% of the UK population are in low-income households. What really gets me angry, though, is the Growing Up in Scotland survey found that 40% of children in Scotland experience income poverty at some time in their childhood. I want you just to take a moment and look around this lecture theatre. I know it's not the fullest, but look around it and just think that every ten people you count, four of them are likely to experience poverty as a child. And how fucking appalling is that? In the richest, one of the richest countries in the world, we have poverty rates that high. And the government likes to think that 0.86% of families are experiencing poverty. No, it's bullshit. That is absolute bullshit. Poverty is a massive problem, and this poverty policy was doing nothing to tackle poverty. Absolutely nothing to tackle poverty. And to go back to the PSC survey, these are lazy, feckless families at all. The majority of families who experience poverty in the UK are in work. They are working hard, but the wages are so fucking low that they do not give them a high enough income to live. And I think we should be ashamed about that, because we also know what we need to do to solve that problem. We need to give these households a higher income. It's as simple as that. And we have the money to do that, and we choose not to do it. We talk about these families in the most disgusting and despicable language, and we don't actually do what we need to do to tackle the problem. And it's as simple as that. And that's what social policy evidence shows you. Just to narrow it down then and calm down a bit and just focus on Scotland then, so what's the situation in Scotland? Is Scotland very different to the rest of the UK? A little bit. So these are the measures for Scotland. This is for P uh, working age adults in poverty, relative poverty. And what I want you to see here is that impact of the housing costs element of it. So if we look at the before housing costs, you'll see poverty in Scotland really is just about the same as the UK. It's a percentage point difference. So not really very, very, very much. We look at the after housing cost measure here though, we see 21% of people in the UK are in poverty after housing costs, but that lowers to 18% in Scotland. And that's basically because we have cheaper housing in Scotland and a much greater supply of social housing. And social housing, especially the way it is in Scotland with very low rents in social housing, means that after housing cost poverty is lower in Scotland. So the fact the Scottish Government, and I know I've given the Scottish Government a lot of digs, the fact the Scottish Government are continuing to expand social housing, the supply of social housing and council housing is brilliant. It's one of the main powers the Scottish Government have where they can really make a difference in tackling poverty because it can lower the outgoings of households. 
And then if we look at the, this is the um, percentage of the child's poverty stats, we see the same, similar figures there. So in before housing costs, it's a two percentage point difference between Scotland and the UK. And then when we look at after housing costs, it's a much wider gap of a seven percentage point difference as well. So households in, the, in Scotland can easily access lower cost housing, so they're less likely to be in poverty after housing costs. As I mentioned earlier there as well, so in policy language at the moment, there's a lot of talk about this idea of early intervention and resilience. And it comes down to this question that many people ask, and it's kind of, and I think the experience of the post-war welfare state, if you go back and listen to my, the podcast I did with my mum, she's a classic case in point that um, many households do seem to leave poverty. So they experience poverty, but they seem to leave it and leave poverty permanently. So there's this interest in policy and in sociology as to why some households remain in poverty, but why do some households escape it? And one of the buzzwords in policy at the moment is this idea of resilience, this bounce back ability. So if a family or household experiences shock, then they'll be able to bounce back and recover from that shock. They won't end up experiencing long-term poverty. As I've talked about quite um, in the lecture about Scottish devolution, this is also um, linked to early intervention, ideas around parenting classes and working with um, young families to ensure that children don't experience poverty in later life. I think the issue with this, though, and it goes back to Ruth Levitas's mud red and sin dis, um, discourses, is arguably this is just pathologising the poor by another name. It's just making that pathologising, blaming the poor look a bit nice. We call it triple P parenting, but we're not really blaming the mothers for being crap parents. We're going to support them. But well, really they are. They're not actually saying these mothers are doing the best they can, but their incomes are incredibly low. And if your income's incredibly low, then it changes your, your behaviour. Go back to J.K. Rowling's quote. It's that petty humiliation. If you're under that constant stress, then you aren't going to think, well, shall I force my screaming baby to eat lettuce? You're going to go, you're just going to think, well, if I shove chips in its gob, it'll shut up and I can be slightly less stressed than I am. So these early intervention projects arguably are just sort of pathology by another name. They're blaming poor people for the poverty they ex experience. But also the panaceas that don't work. And we see, saw this with the Troubled Families Project. The evaluation showed it did not work. Family Nurse Partnership, the one I mentioned last week, another one of these panaceas that's supposed to solve poverty again, doesn't work. All the indicators from the evaluation in England said these households are no better off for this, pro this programme. They're no more likely to be in work. But the only thing it made a difference to was breastfeeding rates. Very, very positive, but in terms of wider problems of poverty, it's, it's neither here nor there. And actually, when we look at the data, when we use surveys like the Family Resource Survey that follow, follow households over the same time, we look at the British Household Panel Survey and Understanding Society, we can answer the bottom question. What is the biggest predictor of an experience of poverty? So what's the main thing that will lead a household to experience poverty? And the answer is fairly straightforward. It's poverty itself. But we are just bloody useless at getting households out of poverty. Once a household has experienced poverty, it just cycles in and out of that experience of poverty. The work opportunities that are available in our labour market are low-skilled, temporary contracts that these families cycle into and out of. There is no opportunity for them to develop their skills and get good quality permanent work. So they just cycle into and out of poverty. <coughs> Well, the education is, the, is one of the things that makes you more resilient to poverty, because you've got the skills and the resources. But can, but can it sometimes happen? Like, 
very, very rarely. Generally, the um, so the question was, um, do people can people with um, university degrees um, end up in poverty? Yes, they can. It can happen to anybody. But generally, if you look at the data, the biggest predictor of poverty is um, or the, is poverty itself and the low income associated with poverty, and that is associated with lower educational attainment. And if you uh, get to university, that's going to help you uh, leave poverty in the longer term. Um, just some further resources there for you to access to understand more about poverty. I think the one thing I, I, I missed from this lecture though that I just want to end as well is, so I bang on literally about poverty a lot, that is the, um, the measure that the UK government used to understand, to measure poverty. And you might be thinking, well therefore is poverty just income inequality? Is, is this income measure of poverty just another measure of income inequality? And really good, actually I only re, I found out about it recently myself, a really good way of separating these and understanding the difference was from 1997 until 2008, <coughs> relative poverty, that measure two-thirds of median household income fell year on year. The government did a lot to tackle poverty. But income inequality, by the measure economists use, the Gini coefficient, increased over that time. So the spread between the highest and the lowest earners increased, but that, med and that median changed. But the government did well to lift people up to that median, but didn't tackle broader inequality. So you can have a, you could have a very unequal society with very low rates of poverty, but similarly you could have a very equal society with high rates of poverty on these measures. And if you actually, and if you download that data set, the household below average income data set, they include the Gini coefficient data, that measure of inequality, and the poverty definition. So just to, I want to just end on that. There is a difference then between poverty and the income measures of poverty and income inequality. We are talking about different things there. So, in this lecture then, I've talked about how does the UK government define and measure poverty. And I've talked about how that definition of the problem of poverty has changed over time. How it's been associated with pathology and blaming poor people and the shift to the discourse of social exclusion in the 1990s and the focus then on child poverty and pensioner poverty. And brought it up to the current day with the Troubled Families Programme. And this idea that this policy was a panacea when clearly it wasn't. And it was tackling the wrong thing. It wasn't tackling poverty, as most people would agree poverty is measured. And that definition then of poverty has changed over time to basically to problematise or stigmatise different populations. That's why government has decided to change it. But also then to link to policy solutions. So the Troubled Families Program stigmatised families as being troubled by these five indicators. So the policy solution was the Troubled Families Program. And then in Workshop 7, you'll explore more about poverty through doing the Poverty and Social Exclusion Survey yourself. Thank you very much.